Hi everybody, Adrian Fuentes here. Did you know that the Democrats of Greater Tucson has a website, thedgt.org, and if you subscribe, it's only 20 bucks, you can support this great weekly communication where folks get together, sometimes there's candidates, sometimes folks like me pop on uh, to help understand what's going on in the world. The Democrats of Greater Tucson, thedgt.org, uh, join up today. Without further ado, uh, ado we have um, Andrew Horn with us. Andrew, thank you for being with us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm happy to be here. So a little bit about myself. I'm I'm Andrew Horn, and I got into this race to remove David Schweikert really because of three core things: uh, the Dobbs decision overturning Roe, the gun violence of uh, in our community around Arizona, around the nation that continues to escalate and the systematic destruction of our public schools. So there was one incident in particular uh, that really brought it home for me and I talk about often, and that was getting a text from my daughter that there was a shooter here. And I was at work when I got that text and it was probably the worst text that any parent can really get from their child. And as a father, I'm concerned about my daughter Eleanor's future and I grew up in Congressional District 1. I went to school here. Uh, and when I did, my parents didn't have to worry about their children getting murdered because of gun violence. But I do. That's a reality that we face right now. And Ale Eleanor should be learning. But instead, she's crying, hiding in a closet. Uh, her classmates, her teachers are fearful when they go to school. And frankly, all of us are at grocery stores, at movie theaters. Um, well, Tucson in particular had a, a, a terrible situation with that, with Gabby Giffords before, and that is just what our, our world is right now, and we need to stop that. Uh, thankfully, Eleanor was safe, but parents and children should not have to live like this. And this district is my home. I was born in Scottsdale and went to our local public schools here for elementary, middle school, high school. I then went to Arizona State, and I have two small businesses in the valley up here just north of you guys as i'm an orthodontist and i went to the university of michigan for my doctorate and my mba and the university of colorado for residency and after private practice in colorado i specifically moved back home to the valley so that my daughter eleanor would grow up with four grandparents in her life right here in arizona and as i said my core issues are gun safety public education health care and the economy and so women's rights is a big part of health care but First, on gun safety, nobody wants to die because they decided to go to work, to school, out shopping. I support expanding background checks, common sense gun laws, and investing in mental health. Mental health is a very important issue that really gets left out of a lot of these conversations, uh, but is extremely important. For education, Arizona students must have access to world-class pre-K through 12 public education that will prepare them to live and work in our highly connected world. Arizona leads the nation in teacher turnover, and if we want our children to succeed, we must invest in teachers. We also need more trade school opportunities and less expensive college tuition to help people learn the skills they need to provide for their families. For healthcare, I'm a doctor, both my parents are doctors, and taught me that everyone deserves accessible, affordable, and quality care and that's not a reality for families in our current system. For seniors, we must strengthen and protect Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. We also need lower prescription drug prices. For the economy, we need to rebuild and reinvent for the 21st century. That starts with upgrading infrastructure, modernizing our ports of entry, and improving our water systems. Infrastructure is incredibly important to our nation, our community, and it's really how we've had a lot of growth uh, with uh, good highway systems, good rail systems. Um, it provides for commerce. Finally, strengthening and investing in our state's growing microchip, technology, and defense sectors are incredibly important. And I'm committed to being a voice for change and progress in Congress. And together, we'll make a difference and prioritize the safety of our children, the quality of our education, accessible health care, and a strong economy. And a little bit more about me and growing up in this district. As I said, I was 
born here in in the valley in scottsdale in congressional district one david schweiker does not hold my values he doesn't hold the values of the people here the last few years he's gotten away uh, with just very, very close margins. Last year, he beat Jevin Hodge by 3,195 votes. That's 0.8% of the Democratic and votes up in this district. And Jevin and Haral before him didn't come from this district. They didn't live in this district. They didn't work in this district. They were outsiders who did a great job preparing the road to remove David Schweikert. But what I think we need is somebody who's from the district, lives in our community, has a small business. I'm raising my young daughter here. Um, I was in the Boy Scouts in this district. I did my Eagle Scout project here. And I think those things are incredibly important when we're looking to find a representative uh, who really meets the values of the people and is ready for some change. And I can't think of too much more to say about myself and uh, other than, I mean, we don't agree with David Schweikert's policies and everything that he's done, and I'm here to remove him. So I'd I'd love to open it up for questions. Again, nowhere near 30 minutes, <laughs> but well, uh, I really like to be interactive and and speak to people about what's going on. So right now, um, <clears throat> so do you prefer Doctor Horn or Andrew? Drew? Andrew, yeah, Andrew. Andrew's okay, great. Andrew. So I'll ask you an interesting question. Yeah. What was your Eagle Service project? Yeah, so uh, at the time, so we have a Sonoran uh, McDowell Preserve here in the valley. It's a north part of Scottsdale. Scottsdale bought out all this land to protect our desert. Uh, it's now the largest city park in the country. Um, and at the time, this was 25 years ago about, it was the city had just purchased this land. It was not in good condition at all. It, it was called Brown's Ranch. It was somebody's ranch. And really it acted as a dump. And so our my project was to gather the community, the people uh, to clean it up. And now Brown's Ranch is a trailhead and you can go out there and walk around. And there are still some things because it was somebody's homestead. So there's some foundations, uh, but it's it's been cleaned up to the natural environment. And it is part of the cities of Scottsdale's uh, largest city park in, in the country. Well, that sounds like a, a great project. And thanks for your leadership. You're um, welcome. Mike Bryan has a question. So uh, you mentioned that kind of the one of the most important things to you is uh, is gun violence. And uh, oh, I only heard really uh, one you know, policy change that that you mentioned. I'd I'd like to hear you go a bit more in detail. Obviously, you know, just background checks is not going to fix the problem that we have. There's a lot that distinguishes American culture and American, you know, constitutional law and American history that really accounts for a lot more of our gun us having much higher gun violence than than just about any other civilization on earth. Um, can you go more into detail about what you think needs to change? And not that necessarily you have the power to change it or, you know, even Congress has the power to change it, but what needs to change about uh, about the American system around firearms to 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 get this under control and to to stop this terrible toll that it takes on us every year? Yeah. <clears throat> so good question. There's a lot there. Uh, truly, there is. You got and plenty of time. Things, you know, that you were talking about that Congress can do. Um but there's a lot outside of it. And a lot of it is, in my mind, uh, it's a social issue, right? It's uh, people being part of their communities. It's the gun violence in our movies, our television shows. It's an American right kind of a thing where everybody wants to carry firearms. They want to, um, I, I go to people's doors, for instance, and they I'm there and I talk about gun violence and what's going on and shootings that have happened and uh, and we things that we all know about. And people standing there at their doors say, well, I'm carrying a gun right now and you are safer with me having a gun than without me having a gun. And well, frankly, I disagree with that. Uh, I think that we need fewer guns in the country, not more guns in the country. They need to be uh, less accessible than more accessible. Uh, one of the things that, you know, right now in our country, there are 500 million guns and it continues to go up. 
And one side of the country believes that the more guns that we have out there, the safer that we all are. And well, at what point is that breaking point? If we had a billion guns in the country, are we safer? I, I disagree. I think that the math and the statistics show that the more guns that we have accessible and around, uh, the worse off we are. The more dangerous our society is, the easier everyone can get a hold of these things. Um, so overall strategy would be to reduce the number of firearms. Now, how do we do that? Uh, that's that's a broad question. I think we can start with banning assault weapons, uh, start with uh, making sure that we know who has firearms um, to protect the police when they go to a call. It's helpful information if they would know that, oh, this person has guns on their property or they're a gun owner. They can be more cautious. They can know what's going on and we can avoid a lot of these problems that, that go on uh, and better protect our police. That's part of it. Now we're talking policy. I think mental health is, is a big one that we need to uh, be focused on. And over the last hundred years or so, uh, the mental health in the United States has been defunded where it's, uh, and some of that is understandable. Things, you know, mental health care 100 years ago is not what it was today. The treatment modalities were totally different. People were getting locked up. And, and a lot of the uh, mental health care facilities of the time were um, private institutions where they didn't want to necessarily rehabilitate people. And that's we have the same thing going on in our prison systems right now. But health care and mental health care should be a top priority right now. Uh, we have what's called an epidemic of loneliness that the United States uh, Surgeon General talks about. And it's we are all feeling, or many of us are feeling lonely and disconnected and isolated. And a lot of that breeds um, gun violence because we don't feel connected, a part of a community. And we need to have social networks. We need to have um, people getting together. We need to help those in need that are under mental duress. And so along with helping our, our police force know where these firearms are, we also need activists within the police force that are trained to work with mental health care patients because a lot of the calls that the police force gets are somebody in need, somebody who's struggling. And a lot of times those systems go awry and we need to be able to get those people the care and attention that they need, not uh, lock them up or have further issues there. Now, um, that's, that's again, there are a few things uh, there that I talked about, um, but there, there's a lot in terms of, um, gun safety, common sense gun solutions, uh, having people go through classes to obtain a firearm, I think would be a good thing. Uh, right now, of course, in the country and specifically in Arizona, uh, you can go buy a gun anywhere, anytime uh, with no background checks, no classes, no anything. And David Schweikert is someone who promotes that and who likes that system. And 4th of July, a year ago, I was at a 4th of July parade here in the Valley and David Schweikert was there as our representative and he had a booth out. And at his booth, he had handguns on the table and it was $5 for a raffle ticket to purchase a handgun. Yeah. That's the opposite of what we should be doing and seeing. We need to make sure those that are getting a firearm are prepared for what they are getting into. Classes are a good part of that. Gun safety checks are a good part of that. Gabby Giffords has a whole institute on uh, how to help solve this issue. And I look to her and her institute for a lot of guidance. I'm not going to solve this problem alone. We all know that. Um, mm -hmm. But there's an overarching, what are our goals that we need to be focused on? Going to, I'll go ahead and we're going to go from uh, gun control to another issue that has many facets to it, and that is immigration. Mm, yep. um, do you, have you kind of thought that one through as well? 
Yeah, of course. Immigration is is a, a big deal. And uh, again, these are these are broad things. I think that I always um, need to be aware of, you know, people need to know where I'm coming from. Immigration is a good thing. Getting people who want to come to our country to uh, start businesses, to better their families, to protect their loved ones. I welcome those people. I welcome so many people into this country. And, you know, I'm an immigrant. My, you know, my great grandparents came over from from Norway, from England, from Germany. Uh, and so many of us here are the same way. And we need to continue to allow people to come into this country. And what we have right now is a broken process. We have uh, not enough federal judges. We have a backlog of people who want to come in here. When people ask to come into this country right now, it's about a seven year wait before they can get processed and come in. And people, they, they're they not respecting that. And frankly, I understand that. And they're getting into this country any way that they can. Now we need to redo this process so that they can uh, come into this country. We know who's entering the country. We know what's going on in their history. Uh, and so we need more federal judges. We need a quicker processing at the at our borders, not just our southern border, but so many places. Uh, but I welcome immigrants. I welcome uh, people to come into this country. What we what we don't like to see is people coming up against the border, them not being able to cross, but being good people and willingly want to make our country a better place and look out for their family, and then not being able to do so. And then they turn to other means that are not safe for them. They're not safe for our country. When they go to a coyote and they pay them, that that creates a terrible system for that the people coming across, they're in danger, they're not being processed. We, as uh, Americans, we don't know who's coming across through those means. Uh, so we need to go from the chaos that's been going on for decades at our border, and we need to speed up and remedy that so that we can get people into the country, we can know who they are, we can process people and and welcome them. Because when they're also coming across uh, and they're in our country illegally, um, but being good members of our community, they're working, they have jobs, they're also being prey to bad employers. They can't be members of unions. They do not get the protections of our legal system, and that's not good for any of us. Uh, so there's there's a lot there with immigration, certainly. Uh, and talking broad measures, I immigrants are good, and we welcome people. And specifically on things, even uh, you know, Trump uh, took away so many visas for high skilled laborers, so people in our tech industry, doctors, and we need to be welcoming those people into our country so that uh, we can be on the leading edge of our technology and chip manufacturing and healthcare. Um, and when people come here to go to college and to go to graduate school, we need to be welcoming them to stay and provide those services to our people. George, uh, Beverly has a question. George, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Um, my question is, is uh, about the guns. Um, would, would you agree that um, service members or veterans and, and police officers have the would you know since they're trained would have a, a better um, better right to carry weapons because you know they're trained. Uh, so I don't know if a, a better right is exactly the right word with it, but I think that they're on more well equipped. Absolutely. Uh, so they would be someone who uh, has gone through courses. They would almost undoubtedly um, be someone who's had background checks, especially in the, in the military or in the police force. Uh, and we, they know how to conduct themselves and, and what's going on. So 
I don't know if a, a better right is exactly the, the, the correct word there, but they would be further along in that process of being able to uh, carry a firearm than just somebody who uh, graduates high school and can buy a gun and has never taken a class. Does that uh, answer your question there? Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, George. Okay, I think Barbara is going to be typing her question in the chat. Uh, Mike, do you have any other uh, chat room questions, or do you have a question? Not thus far. I certainly uh, encourage people to type their questions for for our guest, Dr. Andrew Horn, uh, and raise your hand and uh, ask your questions now. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, yeah. I'd like to hear you talk about... Um, uh, character and fitness, because it uh, seems to me that uh, Mr. Uh, Schweikert has some uh, ethical issues that he's been dealing with over the past couple of terms. I'd like to, to hear you talk about that and why that makes him unfit to serve. Yes. So along with um, uh, our values not aligning uh, with David Schweikert, it's also, yes, he has 11 ethical convictions for campaign finance fraud that uh, he was found guilty of in the House of Representatives. And that is, that's a big issue. And I think that should be a big issue for everyone, not just uh, the Democrats who want to remove him. I look at that kind of as he had campaign finance violations, which is means he was misusing the money that was in his campaign. Now, he what he was doing with those was is a kind of another discussion. But he is on the House Ways and Means Committee, which determines our United States tax structure. So we have somebody who is misusing and misappropriating money in his own campaign uh, bank and finance and is using money improperly, deciding the tax structure and the monetary, uh, what our United States government is doing. I, I, I think that's wild and crazy. Um, I, I think that when you have something like 11 ethical convictions uh, in uh, the United States Congress, we need to be looking at this. The entire country needs to be looking at this and, and thinking, well, how are we allowing this person to represent us? Um, and this, that kind of gets to um, really a, a question of morals or values about, well, one side... Uh, looks at things like convictions uh, or as bucking the trend, as that's an outsider, they're doing what uh, what everyone should be doing. They're not playing by the rules and they're fighting for uh, things. And I think those rules are there for a reason, uh, especially when they're ethical convictions for misusing money. Uh, where uh, he's not fit to serve uh, for many reasons, but certainly that is uh, among them. I don't think uh, that winning the general election against David Schweikert is going to come down to shouting out the loudest. He's that's that's been there for a very long time, um, and there. Uh, that's I just I had to look down. That's a very good question. I'm going to get to that question surely in a second. <laughs> um, but. It's not going to come down to who shouts the loudest on David Schweikert's ethical convictions because uh, so many people look at that as, oh, he's he's a scumbag, but he's our scumbag. And that's that's just how Congress works is we need somebody who's uh, out there and fighting and who's a, a terrible person for us. And I disagree with that. What we need are good people in office, people who uh, uphold the law who can write laws that are just and fair for everybody, not, not those who skirt them and, uh, and disagree with them. Uh, I, I'm gonna, Michael, I'm sure you have another question. Joseph, can I answer that question from Shirley in the chat there? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, go for it. Okay, Shirley, I, I forgot to say it, and now I just feel terrible. Yes, I'm Andrew Horn. No, I'm not related to Tom Horn. Uh, <laughs> And I forgot to say that, and I it was just a huge miss. I forget to say it so often, and that's why in any, you know, when we do debates on television, it's always the first thing because I forget about it. And I'm sure so many of you were going, is he Tom Horn's nephew or son or what's going on? <laughs> no relation, never met him. 
Uh, that's uh, a big deal. And problem separating myself from him. Yes, because it, it comes to mind with so many people immediately. Uh, but I've largely turned a liability into an asset. So in so many of my messaging, in text messages, online, uh, when I go door to door and I meet people, uh, certainly when I go door to door, I it's the first thing out of my mind <laughs> uh, because they remember that. It's kind of a, a, a hook where they go, oh yeah, you're the guy who's not related to uh, Tom Horn. And for, I imagine everyone here knows, but Tom Horn is the Arizona superintendent of public education. He has been a large part of systematically destroying our public education. Uh, and I'm not a fan. Uh, along with, uh, I'm gonna say with, with Michael's uh, comment there, I think Tom Horn should have not been in office either uh, because he has ethical convictions. He has a lifetime ban from the Securities and Exchange Commission. He cannot trade stocks because uh, of things that he was doing in the 60s and 70s that were illegal. And he can't be associated with our um, stock exchanges here in the United States. And I look at that and I go, how are we continuing to elect somebody who has been proven by the United States government to be uh, an unethical person who's misusing all this. I just, I don't understand it, but surely, yes, absolutely. I am not related to Tom Horn. Uh, and that is a little bit of a challenge, but it's, it's also something that uh, once people hear it and they know it, they, they are not likely to forget it. And on my, my larger signs, this is my small sign, but on my larger sign, I, I put a picture of myself on there so that they go, Oh, that's, that's not that, other guy. Uh, so it, it's actually, it's worked out fairly well, but uh, it is still a challenge that I, I work on every day. And it's also right. in the very, very, very top, even above your name <laughs> of your website. <laughs> yes, that's true. Okay. Mike, do you have uh, any other questions? <clears throat> uh, yeah, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Karen Gleason wants to know, uh, well, she says that there's a number of gun manufacturers who keep a bullet fired from each gun they sell. Uh, which they do for forensic purposes. Do you think that there should be a requirement for that this should be a requirement for every gun sold? Should the ATF or FBI maintain a registry of those? Uh, yes. So I'm, I'm looking at that question right now. I think that's a, a, a great idea. Uh, I think that's, um, you know, something that some manufacturers are, are doing. It's not the law in any way. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of pushback from the NRA uh, because they do not like, um, you know, tracking because they, they don't, I, I, I disagree with a lot of that, uh, probably all of that if we went line by line, but part of, um, having a firearm, I think we need to know where these are going and what, uh, who's buying them, where they go from person to person. We need to be able to know again, if the police are entering uh, someone's home, they should be able to look up and see, Hey, it, are, is there something dangerous going on? here, are we in a situation that we need to be prepared for? Um, yes, the, the quick answer is yes. That is a, a huge deal that the NRA has been fighting for so long. And even, I don't know if you all have seen so many of the videos being done uh, on that, but nothing can be digitized in the firearms space. It all needs to be paper records, which is a disaster for uh, tracking and looking up uh, the history of a gun and where it's been used for criminal offenses. That's a mess. And we absolutely need to fix that. Um, the, the ATF, the, the FBI, we need to provide them with resources. Uh, and there's so many things that you, you look at and you go, why is this not being done already? When Ford sells a vehicle, there's fantastic tracking about uh, where our vehicles are going. They have serial numbers. They have all of this. Every part has a label. So if it's used in a car bomb, we know where it came from and its history and who is registered to. And we don't have that for firearms. And, and it's really because of a large uh, lobby group. And absolutely, I, I'm committed to fighting against that. Yeah, I, w I always wonder why the Democrats don't accuse the NRA of being soft on crime because they're preventing us from tracking criminals and their and their, you know, their firearms. Absolutely. And it's it's 
one, we can absolutely make that statement. And I believe in that statement. It they they very much try to muddy the waters and say, well, you are violating our uh our rights to be hidden and we need to, you know, be able to have a gun without the government knowing who has one. And it's yeah, it is a, a mixed bag, but I I agree with you. Uh, Barbara Warren would like to know uh, what you plan to do about uh, the climate crisis. Oh, that's a good one. Um, so the the climate crisis, I mean, we can start with very basics, but it's it's real. It's an issue. Uh, it's affecting the world, not just the United States, as we know. Uh, there's some things that I I look at and I, I of course, wondering why haven't we uh, gotten into a lot of this so far? So cap and trade, I think, is a, a good thing that we need to be doing uh, for uh, I, I don't want to, you know, go too much into what that is, but it's uh, we have X number of emissions going on in the United States right now. Uh, the United States government gives everyone uh, a ticket saying, hey, you can, you know, provide this much and then slowly lowering that over time. And companies that do a better job uh, with their emissions, they can sell it to a company that's doing a worse job. And the goal there is to slowly lower the amount of carbon emissions that are happening in the United States. And then hopefully, you know, we we move this around the world with things like the Kyoto Protocol. But we, we slowly lower the amount of emissions uh, that's happening because right now, it's if it's on your your property, you can have free reign uh, to uh, emit and pollute and and do things. And that's when we get into a lot of issues, certainly with mining uh, of, across the country in our history is somebody and, and I'll get back to climate, but that protecting uh, mining has a, a, a long history of doing the wrong thing and mining ravaging our community for resources and taking the goods and then when there becomes an issue that company is now bankrupt and they do not clean up anything of what's going on so all the tailings all of the the destruction that they have down river they say we're we're bankrupt and we can't uh, manage that so we need to be uh kind of like an insurance policy on this when they are taking resources, which definitely should not happen in our federal and state public lands, by the way. Um, but when they're taking resources out of the ground, they should be paying into a fund that is acts kind of like uh, an insurance for when that company eventually says, hey, we're bankrupt. There's a, a pool of money that has been gathered to help clean up and restore that area. Um, but on climate change, uh, absolutely, we need to be doing uh, everything that we can to be reducing emissions, uh, to be changing, in my mind, a lot of the the plastics uh, over back to either glass or some other method, because microplastics are a big issue, and that's going to continue to uh, to be a, a very large issue. That's a little bit separate than climate change, but it absolutely uh, harms our ecosystem, our plant life, our wildlife, our ocean, our of course, full of uh, all of that, but there's there's a lot to do um, with the climate, and we need to be protecting it. We need to be watching our emissions and systematically lowering them uh, year over year to help us all. Not only with the climate change, but it also helps with our general health, uh, asthma, and so many of the uh, health issues that people see around manufacturing and all sorts of things. We need to be looking out for the people. Well, that's a perfect pivot to Barbara Warren's second question. She's also a physician and she wants to know what the greatest threats to our public health in Arizona are, including of course, women's health. Yeah, well, so biggest, well, yeah. yeah. So um, can, you, can you say that again? Because I, I, I jump around so many times there. Women's health is a huge issue, but Sure. She just uh, she just wonders what you think the greatest threats to our public health are here in Arizona. OK, well. Certainly with a, a, I mean, women's health is a. Huge issue, and that affects uh, more than just women of childbearing age. And I, I, I say that many times uh, over and over. I've made many posts about it, but 
things like the 1864 ban that was, you know, law here for a very short time and we thankfully got removed. David Schweikert wants to see things like that nationally. He's in favor of uh, taking control of women's bodies, not allowing them to get medical procedures that they need. And that, that affects everyone, not just women of childbearing age, because when laws like that occur, medical providers are skeptical about coming into states where they see their license threatened. They can see themselves uh, coming under criminal conviction for things that they learn, what they know, what is good for their patients. So we see uh, a brain drain from Arizona, from uh, Arkansas, from various states that have done things uh, like the IVF bans. They, some of those states, they lost very important uh, pediatric, cardiatric uh, healthcare providers for you know children. Uh, it's doctors of every specialty are worried about going into states where states do not respect uh, their knowledge, their education, and what they can do to help patients. Even a little bit more specifically, when OBGYNs are not coming to this state, even if other specialties still did, we have a lower supply of women's healthcare providers, which makes it more difficult for every woman to get and receive treatment for every issue going on. So women's healthcare is, is a huge issue. Of course, as I said, I have a 10 year old daughter. One of the big things getting into this was uh, the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade and David Schweikert wanting the 1864 ban nationally. Someone who's co-sponsored the Life Starts at Conception Act six times He's very vocal on this, and that's a big issue. Um, that's not the only issue for healthcare in Arizona, of course. There, there are many others, but that's, I mean, that's a big one. So that's, that's, that's one where we're we're going head to head with uh, women and doctors, and the government's getting in there, and uh, we're having people go to other states to get healthcare, and that's or go to Mexico, uh, and that's not right. Oh, uh, just as I have to say, just in my world, dental care, um, that's a huge issue. Now, on, on just dental care in the United States, I could talk for a long time um, because dental care has been outside of the United States healthcare system for so long as uh, that's how the dental lobby groups work is they have really tried very hard to keep it out of Medicare Medicaid, uh, any of the national programs, and even the, the dental insurance system works very differently than a medical insurance, which has its issues. Um, but the people going to Mexico for dental care is a huge thing nationally. People leaving the country for uh, dental services. Uh, there are entire cities down on the border, Molar City, uh, where people go across the border, of course, not only for prescription drugs and everything there, but for dental procedures because uh, they're left out because that is kind of this, the structure of that part of healthcare. And for a long time, you know, vision was, was a big one there. Vision and dental are two that are left out a lot and dental continues to be left out. Uh, and that's a real issue. And just as, as a little anecdote, my brother, um, is an internal medicine infectious disease doctor. Uh, he's in Omaha at Creighton. And it's a big thing of people come in, they have a heart issue. Uh, they have some a growth on their heart. And it came from uh, having an abscess in their mouth from a tooth infection. And many people do not see the, the relationship and what's going on. If you had a huge abscess and something on your arm, People would recognize it. Their their dental care is is lacking. Uh, a lot of times, if you have dental pain, it spikes and it feels very painful, and then it slowly numbs and kind of goes away. But they still have a major issue, and it's still something going on. So anyone who's gone through any cancer treatments, getting dental care is a huge part of it because if you have an, an infection anywhere in your body and you're going through chemo, radiation, 
uh, you need to have clearance for this because it will kill you. And it's a huge thing. And nationally, statewide, dental care is is a healthcare problem that is being left out and being mismanaged. Well, should uh, dental care be part of our national health care programs? Yes. Right. Uh, Barbara, i sorry, R. Benson wants to know, would you support at least maintaining but preferably expanding the CDC's firearms mortality studies? Absolutely. There's uh, absolutely there's I. I don't know why anyone would be against such a thing. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the Republicans have been for for many years. They they prevented the CDC from studying firearms uh, mortality as a public health issue. Yes, well, the the, the Republicans are against a, a lot of things having to do with the <laughs> CDC and uh, our healthcare. And absolutely, research needs to be conducted at all levels for uh, so many things. And just if I may, I'm going to take that just to talk uh, briefly about. We need to be supporting institutions like the CDC, the National Institutes of Health. We need to be leading funding and research for cancer, for treatments. That's that's a public good where money spent on this stuff helps everyone in so many ways that they don't necessarily acknowledge um, because it is a, it's a big system and it takes a lot of time, but. The institutions like the National Institutes of Health and the CDC are very important, and we need to be getting researchers there. We need to be getting academics there. We need to be supporting them and broadening their funding. Okay, Susie Anderson <laughs> has her hand up. Susie? Uh, do you see AI as a problem? I mean, we have enough misinformation without AI. And AI is going to make it extremely more difficult to figure out what's the truth. I mean, if it comes out of the orange man's mouth or a guy with a MAGA hat, I know exactly where it comes from. But uh, how, it, it, there's so much misinformation that can be spread without are being able to recognize it, how are we going to deal with that? Or how are you going to deal with that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So there, um, one that's that's an emerging topic, right? Like it's, it's something that's been growing over the last few years and we're seeing uh, pretty much an exponential growth on artificial intelligence. Now, what we have right now is, is not all the way to artificial intelligence. It's some some fun modeling programs uh, that are interesting uh, and are can be uh, dangerous depending on how you're using them. Now they're they're very useful tools, uh, and a tool can be used for evil or for good. I look at and I have for 10, 15, 20, I'll say 15 years, uh, looked at computer modeling and artificial intelligence as a huge tool in medicine for uh, the capabilities there for reading radiographs, for taking in a huge database of information on a patient, cross-referencing it with so many studies, things that we as individuals cannot read or take in that much information and giving at least guidelines or helpful hints. Look out for this, do a test for this. Um, there's a lot there that can be powerful and can be used tremendously effectively to help so many people. Or even uh, in emerging economies, likely uh, you know ours in the future, but in places around the world of uh, how to distribute resources the best. How do you get uh, rice and medicine to people in certain countries when they don't have the infrastructure? Um, as individuals, that's a, a lot to process, but an artificial intelligence with the right data set can be extremely helpful there. Now, it can also be used for dangerous things. And, and dangerous things, uh, women are the subject of a lot of that right now. Certainly celebrities with um, taking their likenesses, putting them places where they shouldn't be, or uh, you know, a lot of things there. That should scare people, absolutely. 
Uh, that's that's taking somebody's um, image, their their property, their likeness, and using them in ways that they shouldn't be. Now, some of that gets a little bit interesting because, well, how do you get uh, an older representative to understand what's going on uh, when they have not grown up with uh, computers or software or have never used these systems to see about them? Uh, I think there's some creative ways where you can get people's attention, um, uh, but that that's that's a difficult one. I think um, it is an artificial intelligence will continue to grow and change our economy. It's going to um, change people's workflow. It's going to remove a, a lot of assistance in the business world because you can type up documents, you can you can do things. The creative aspects uh, of the world, I think, will will be there because the human ingenuity and thinking outside the box, uh, I think, is going to be extremely important. But what we need is somebody in Congress who understands artificial intelligence, somebody who's uh, lived with it, has worked with it, and knows the challenges that are going to present itself. Um, now, all of the uh, how to do that is still unknown, but we need to realize that it is coming um, and how to harness it, how to make sure that we know what publications are being written by artificial intelligence, uh, what images are being created with artificial intelligence. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of the tricking that's going on all day uh on online does not continue to get out of control like it is right now absolutely okay and mike uh, brian has his hand up uh yeah jave stevenson has a uh, question in the chat he uh wonders uh what you want to do around education uh since uh, as a <clears throat> national uh politician as a in congress given that you know a lot of educational policy and funding runs through the uh state level yeah that's a good question um so yes a lot of people uh think and and realize that education uh does come down to a lot of local politics and your local school board but the federal government has huge reach in this space uh when when i think about things that are you know seemingly simple to someone of my generation but the desegregation of schools for instance and the title acts the um the title acts being uh you know everyone needs to be treated equally whether you know color of your skin or handicaps or anything that's federal level processes that are mandated by the federal government that's how states are given money from the federal government things like uh the desegregation of our schools in alabama that was johnson coming in federally and saying, hey, this is not right. You need to change. Uh, that didn't happen on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, and that is important to remember. So as a federal level, there are things like uh, Trump appointing Betsy DeVos to the head of education. Her doing that, one of her goals was the systematic destruction of our public school system they had two places in mind. They had Arizona and Florida for the boom of the charter schools and so much that's going on. And we're seeing that right now. It's largely a top-down process that we need to stop. Um, now that it's kind of gotten hold in Arizona and we have the ESA vouchers going on, that makes it far more complicated. Um, but as a federal level, we need to be continuing to support our schools. We need to be making sure that the resources that are going to the schools, uh, that is, again, a big chunk of Arizona public education, uh, over 20% is funded by the federal government. There are things like the free and reduced school lunch programs. That is a federal program that we need to be expanding. And I think that if people are mandated to be in our public schools, we need to be providing them with the nutrition uh, to be there so that they can be learning and not be worried about where their next meals are coming from. We need to be supporting people. Uh, we need to be supporting our, our teachers. 
we need to be pushing that uh, top down. And the federal government, again, has has a huge role to play there, uh, more than I think a lot of people realize. So should the okay. uh, should Congress uh, fund uh, free meals for kids in schools for everybody? Yes. Okay, I like your concision. Uh, so Barbara, uh, looks like uh, George Beverly has her has his hand up. Yes. Um, I have a question. My question is, is what's your stance on uh, diversity, equity and, and inclusion and how would you uh, fight for it if you agree with it or if you don't agree with it? So the, the question there that I get is, do I believe in equality for all based on, you know, so many whatever parameters you want to set, whether it's uh race, religion, sexual preference, any mm -hmm. any of that. Yes, I absolutely uh, believe in equality for all. And then how would I uh, do that in Congress? Well, we need people there, first of all, who believe in those things uh, and will fight to make changes, uh, you know, accordingly. Uh, there, there are many things that uh, we should all be, frankly, worried that will be taken away because Things like the Supreme Court saying, uh, yes, uh, it's legal to have same-sex marriages, that can be taken away. Just like Roe v. Wade was taken away, the Supreme Court uh, is not a, a legislative body, and we need to enshrine those things even deeper in our institutions because a lot of these rights and freedoms that we have right now, given the state of the Supreme Court, can change and, and we need to be fighting for them. Okay. Well, Are I don't think that's my question. I think I think yeah, go for it. Sure. equality for all is one thing, but I'm talking about specifically for people of color communities. Uh, we're hit the hardest when it comes to this kind of stuff. And when we're, we're still, you're still fighting just to be Americans. So DEI is just a, it's a stop me measure in order to even just get into the door. And even when we're in the door, we're still treated as second-class citizens in w whatever we are, we're, we're in. So my, que my, my specific question it was, do you believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion? I should have said for, for people of color, because when you start talking about me Medicare or you start talking about economics, this is the reason why we uh, Black people are starting to vote for Republicans, because they feel that even though they're racist, they're still being more advanced financially or are being able to be included in certain things rather than the Democratic Party, because the Democratic Party for years have taken our vote for granted. So once again, the question is, is how do you fight to keep diversity, equity and inclusion, the, the program of DEI or the, uh, the understanding of DEI for people of color? And in government positions or just in America in general, but how do you um, help people understand that it's important and we can't get, get away from it? Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't answer your, your question before. Um, yes, it, it is important. I think, uh, you know, speaking with people like yourself about what they find important uh, is extremely important. <laughs> Uh, valuable. I definitely don't take yours or any votes for granted, that's for sure. Uh, and we need people talking about those issues constantly. I'm very saddened to hear that uh, people would think that anyone in this group or myself are uh, ignoring what's going on in your life or people of colored lives. Uh, that That's distressing to hear. And absolutely, I support uh diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, George, thank you. So looks like we're coming up on uh, one o'clock. Uh, Andrew, you did a great job. You thought maybe be, you. you have a hard time uh, filling an hour, but I think you've done a great job. Hey everybody, it's Senator Mark Kelly. As all of you know, Arizona Democrats have had a lot of important wins over the last few years. We won two U.S. Senate races, and we delivered Arizona's electoral votes to President Biden and Vice President Harris. We elected Governor Katie Hobbs, Secretary of State Adrian Fontes, and Attorney General Chris Mays. Now, those elections were close, and our victories mattered. 
Arizona Democrats from the federal to the local level have delivered real results for our state on critical issues like combating climate change, lowering prescription drug costs, protecting the right to vote, and preventing more restrictions on abortion access. The Democrats of Greater Tucson offers the opportunity to hear from elected officials and candidates about that important work and the issues that matter to them. That information will be invaluable as Arizonans head to the polls. So this election cycle, whether you're signing up to knock doors, make phone calls, or joining the Democrats of Greater Tucson to hear from and speak to Democrats in our area, please know that your voice matters and we need you on this team. Thank you.